So good morning, welcome. Um, this is the talk I gave, what is it, last week at EOS at Embedded Linux conference in Prague. So it was done for an embedded audience. So if something doesn't make sense to you, please raise your hand and ask questions. It's very entertaining to see the core boot talk because they kind of have the same problems as we do in Embedded, but that's another thing. So this talk is going to be about booting user space into one second. And to do that, uh, first I want to def uh, see, I'm mentioning booting user space in one second. I don't say booting cold boot. So this is the bit from when the kernel ends till your graphical login manager is starting up. And I implemented it originally on the Beagle board here, but I needed a bit of a faster CPU, so I switched to the Panda board over there. And I hope to be doing a live demonstration later on in this talk. So, like I said, it's not defined from power on till a usable desktop, but the tiny bit that is be in between the kernel and between your login, login manager is starting up. So the platform, I started on a Beagle board. It's an embedded platform, it has an ARM CPU that can run up to one gigahertz, Cortex-A8, so it has floating point and all nice things. It has 512 megabytes of RAM, so you can run a GNOME 2 desktop on it. So when I did my work, I used the Angstrom distribution that's optimized for the board, and I work for TI where we both use the Beagle board and Angstrom, so that was a no-brainer. And like I said, later on I cheated a bit by moving to a faster platform, the Panda board. So on the Beagle board and on the Panda board, they have an OMAP3 and an OMAP4 chip. With boot up is uh, divided in a few stages. First we have a small ROM code loader that will load, load our first stage bootloader from the SD card, which will then load the second stage bootloader U-boot, which will then load the kernel, kernel will load user space, and after the init we'll get up to a graphical desktop. So let's see how long these bits take. On a bigger board, typically, the ROM-based loader is instantaneous because the first, uh, first stage bootloader is a few kilobytes, approximately 40 or 50. So that loads really quickly on into the internal RAM. That sets up the uh, SD RAM and to load U-boot. U-boot is quite slow, as you can see, 12 seconds, but that includes a three-second countdown timer. Uh, the kernel boots in approximately seven seconds, still a bit slow, but starting user space takes about two minutes. And then login manager takes 20 seconds to log in and load your desktop. So when looking at this picture, it was obvious what you wanted to optimize, the two minutes, which is what I did. So at a lot of conferences, there have been a lot of talks about optimizing the bootloader and the kernel. I'm not going to do that. User session uh, optimization has been done, uh, done as well. For example, slim DM um, or just don't use GNOME, use XFCE or something like that. People are doing that as well. I'm not going to do that as well. And more importantly, these require significant code changes. And I'm not a coder. I'm an integrator. I studied to be an electrical engineer, not to be a computer scientist, but I'm still stuck in a software job. So I do what I do best. I look at the part that was the slowest, which was the user space portion, about two minutes. And it's nearly all shell script. I know shell script, so I should be able to fix that. And then there is a new init solution written by Rockstars. System D. It's a replacement for the System uh, 5 init thing. And they're really particular about how you want to spell it. Most people try to spell it with a capital D. No, no space in between. And it's written largely by Germans, so please don't write it the French way. So normally, SysV init has an init tab that defines the run levels. Each run level has a few scripts and you do symlinking magic and it's been around for a really, really long time, 20 or 30 years. And they said, 
we're not going to optimize it. People have done it before. Upstart tried to optimize it. OpenRC is a bit of a different approach. They said, no, we're going to do something completely different. Most modern hardware has multiple CPUs. Well, the BeagleBoard doesn't, but the Panda board does. So they said, we want to run everything in parallel as much as possible. They have a few tricks up their sleeve for parallelism. Uh, for example, socket-based activation. Every network service is started in parallel and they leave it up to the kernel to figure out uh, all the socket magic. Read the systemd presentations and the video for more background on that. But that is systemd. It was new and it was a big hype, so I decided to try it. Why did I choose systemd? Like I said, it was being hyped at the time and I know a few of the developers, I've met them in conferences and they seemed like smart people, which is a big pro when you're writing an init system, you don't want to have it written by idiots. But I'm working on embedded systems and I was fearing that it might be too desktop or server heavy, but a nice surprise, it listed an embedded consulting firm, Gustavo's firm, where you could buy support. So people were using it on embedded. And at the time they said it's going to be in Fedora Core 15 and Fedora 16, so that was a good thing. Right now OpenSUSE is adapting it, there are Debian packages for it, there are rumors Ubuntu will be switching to it, uh, there's Gentoo support, but it looks like Gentoo will be staying with OpenRC for the time being. But still, lots of adoption, so another good thing. It has no shell scripts, that's a positive thing. But on the other end, shell scripts is basically the only thing I know. So what did they replace it with? They replaced it with so-called units, which are not scripts, but more like configuration files. So if you have ever looked at the system fee in its script, you will see it has a lot of boilerplate, start, stop, restart. And the last few years, you have a huge block of comments at the top called the Linux standard base header, where you can list dependencies and whatnot. That's not needed anymore. Most system PD units are four or five lines. So it's really simple to do. You can just say, I want to be started after this. I want to be started before that. I conflict with this. And this is my start command. This is my stop command. That's all you need. So it's a lot simpler. And I like it. And there's no overhead in invoking the shell interpreter. I work on an embedded build system called Open Embedded which uses BitBake recipes, and they're kind of like Gen2 eBuilds, and the unit structure resembles that because you can have dependencies, uh, ordering, so I could understand that. The next bit of systemd, I tried it. It uses standard auto tools, it's cross-compiled cleanly, which is incredibly awesome. So that was not a lot of work for me to integrate. That took just a few minutes. Its build system is auto tools based, so when something goes wrong, I know how to fix it. It's not some weird Python-based build system, which was not a big pro. And they manage their sources in git at freedesktop.org. So if I want to send a patch, I know where to send it and how to extract it. So I don't have to learn funky systems like Bazaar and use Launchpad, just stock git and free desktop. So this basically are my personal pet peeves, what can go wrong with an init system or a package, but system D hit all the right bells, so let's try it. Leonard and uh, the system D gang did a lot of presentations on it and they put a lot of videos online, so if you have a few days you can watch all the videos. There are a ton of blog posts about it and they have an RSC channel. The make files are a bit confusing, um, but you can look at the blog posts. So people say it lacks documentation, but if you have looked at the system fee in the documentation, that's a single man page. So not a lot of documentation on that. Most of the documentation exists in the 20 years or 30 years of experience with it. So from a documentation point of view, system D is a good thing. So let's get started. There already was rudimentary systemd support and open embedded, so I tried that. That kind of worked, updated it to the latest release, got the serial port working so I could look at it and log in. I built a, built a small root file system, which is basically uh, an SSH daemon, Avahi for network support, and login. So really tiny, 
and then I got timing info on that. It was as slow as system fee in it. So why is it as slow? Uh, it turns out that it was still using system fee compatibility, so it was using all the old init scripts. I tried to do it in parallel, but it couldn't detect the dependency, so it was doing it linear. So what I did next, I looked at it, used the built-in units for UDEV and Dbus and Avai. Those were all upstream, so just just copying them over. Um, Dropper didn't have a real unit, so I stole the one from Arc Linux. That worked well. And we had a few issues uh, with different names. For example, systemd calls it Dbus. In Open Embedded, we call it Dbus1. So we had to do some uh, masking magic to mask those services. And it helps to complain a lot in the systemd channel because they will answer you if you're in European times. So boot time went down from approximately one minute to 18 seconds. This is just starting network, starting SSH, and logging into a console. So 18 seconds is still far too long for that. So, oh, that doesn't work. So what is it doing those 18 seconds? It has a built-in analyzer tool, so you can see the horizontal axis is 18 seconds. The red part is when the service is activating. So you can see uh, it does some mounting, it does some file system check, uh, real-time clock, and then you have a really long bar for UDAV. So it seems to be doing things, but there are a lot of gaps when it do doesn't seem to be doing here. This is about one and a half second. Every subdivision is a second. So something is clearly wrong. Let's zoom out a bit. You can see it's starting a lot of things and it's taking a really long time. So one of the systemd developers is also the main UDEV maintainer. And he said, it looks like UDEV is taking a really long time. Can you just run the UDEV trigger? which triggers UDEV, will create all the file system nodes again, run all the scripts, uh, but that will exit immediately and run it in the backgrounds. The UDEV ADM settle is just a way to have a foreground process wait till UDEV trigger is complete. It turns out it always took three minutes. Whatever you did, how many rules you had, always three minutes. So we looked at recent commits, and there was one where they added a except for syscall. I have no idea what it does, but I didn't have it, and I hit the standard timeout. So this turned out to be a toolchain problem for embedded developers. Most things are toolchain problems. We need to cross-compile, because we tend not to compile on the board itself. So UDEV depends on a system call, sysexcept4. It has existed in the kernel for a long time, but for the ARM CPUs, it only appeared in 2.6.36. We were using 2.6.32 at that point. So what we did is updated the libc headers, rebuilt uh, eglibc, patched the kernels to add the syscall, a few backports, cherry picks, update, rebuild, which, yeah. At that point, uh, glibc 2.11 and eglibc 2.12. The version is not really that important. I think it was added in 2.6 or something as a syscall, but it looks at the kernel headers to if, if it's there or not. So the libc version is not that important, but your kernel header is, and it's just a really simple commit. It's just hooking up the syscall, so it's easy to cherry pick for the older kernels. We did that. Uh, eventually, the rebuild took an hour or so, lots of to compile, but finding this out is approximately two weeks worth of work. Class? No. Um, this is a UDEV problem, and you can opt to use an older UDEV version. I think 160 or so, they're at 174. You can backport it, that's what I did. 
Um, the Red Hat people backported all the needed patches, all three of them, to 2632 because I think that is RL5 is 2632 and they got it running. Yeah, or you can opt not to use UDEV, and then you have to use some slight tricks. Uh, you can still use systemd, but you don't get the nice features that when your serial console appears, it will automatically spawn the Getty. That's what we use. So as soon as UDEV has tagged the device node, we spawn the Getty. You can just say, I'm not going to use that. You can use systemd without UDEV, but it's a lot nicer with UDEV because you can wait on device nodes, especially in embedded where you have have to load firmware using a non-standard way and wait for device nodes. It's really nice. Um, for the older kernels, you need the sysopsec4 syscall, so on ARM, that's one patch. The C group mount point change, that is a one-line addition. You need to backport that as well. And if you want to get really fancy, uh, newer kernels can tell you at which console they're running on, so you can auto spawn a Getty there. That's also a patch that went into 2638. You can also backport that. If you are on 2632, Red Hat already did that for you. You can use that. But the most important ones are the syscall and uh, the C group mount point. So when I started, Beagle was running 2632 and systemd was working great. Right now, this one is running 3.0, and this one is still on 2.6.35. So relatively recent kernels, not that recent. So that's what we did. I also added the C group mount point, but that's a bit irrelevant for this presentation. We're down to three seconds. So that's a nice improvement. You would have expected that it would be something something else. So let's go to the SVG for that. So this is slightly less than three seconds. Uh, but you can see it's not 18 seconds long again. And everything is just a lot tighter integrated. So three seconds, it's pretty good almost down to two seconds. So we moved some unused UDEV rules. It turns out we installed every rule twice and through some bug in UDEV, it would run every rule twice. So what it would do, it would probe block devices again. We try to mount them, slow, 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 just remove them. Uh, System D is built for desktop, so it has a virtual console setup where it loads a pretty font for your terminal and all that sort of things. We don't need that. Uh, we don't also don't need a lot of mounts like debugfs and things like that. They're nice for debugging, but they add time. And right now we're in the 100 millisecond range of optimization, so when it takes 80 milliseconds to mount debugfs, you just remove that. And it turns out that it was CPU bound, not I/O bound, so we switched to a faster machine. And we're down to 1.1 seconds. So that's a nice improvement when you start from approximately 2 minutes to 60 seconds to 18 to 1. And that is... So as you might have noticed, the format of this changed a bit. This was all uh, well salmon colored. And this now has a gray bar. We added a kernel boot time indicator as well and a total user space indicator. So you can see the kernel takes approximately four seconds, user space approximately one second. And at the bottom, we have a summary. 1.1 milliseconds, total five seconds. And it's looking pretty good. Kernel five seconds, nah, not that good, but all this and at the bottom, GDM starts. It still takes a few seconds for GDM to start up, but as we defined in the beginning, till GDM starts up. So this is all the work you need for a graphical desktop. So since we're that close, why not try to do it less than one second? It's one of those magical barriers. Uh, and what did we do? Well, we switched the CPU governor to performance, tried faster SD cards, did some more complaining in the uh, systemd channel, 
Didn't really help. <laughs> and this was after I already accomplished the sub-second boot. So I was, I was preparing my talk for last week and this week, and I, like, I, I cannot go here like, yeah, it's saying less than one second, it's slightly more, than that's just not good enough. So I was thinking, what, what has changed in between? I updated the software, updated UDAV, maybe it got slower, consulting my notes. Hey, we had went through a small system, uh, serial console naming change, it really stupid, but the device now changed from TTYS2 to TTYO2. So we're not using the stock serial subsystem anymore, but an OMAP optimized with all kinds of things. I don't know what changed, but it was painful. And, but I changed the U-boot to output to serial. So what happens if I change the console to quiet and TTY1? So looking back, kernel 3.7 seconds. It saves two and a half seconds, not spewing to serial console. So finally, we are at sub-second, and the kernel boots a lot faster as well. So let's have a look at how that one looks. So the kernel is nice and short, user space is nice and short, and you can see everything is nice and tight, no big things. You see the big gap uh, around here is where UDEV finds uh, the MMC devices and things like that. Here it finds uh, the serial console and it will start to run the Getty. And at the bottom gdm.service and it tells us that the total user space boot time till GDM uh, is 2.4 seconds. And with, well, you can subtract the kernel and 825 milliseconds. And this is Panaboard 2.6.35.7 Seven built on June 20. So we finally have reached the point what we need. But we can save a bit more. We can save three seconds in U-boot by just disabling the timer. And what we have now is that U-boot takes around nine seconds, kernel one and a half second. So when you show this picture, people saying, why is your bootloader so stupid? That's a really good question. Um, it shuffles things around a bit. For the new bigger board, we uh, did some tricks by loading the kernel immediately in the right place so the kernel doesn't have to uh, relocate itself and that saved two seconds. And on the, the new bigger board, we're around four to five seconds in the bootloader stage and the kernel boots in 0 0.8 seconds. So that's a lot better, but it's still far too long. We're investigating other options uh, but we're a bit constrained because we also need USB and networking support in a bootloader for development. And if we can just scrap that, we could just paste on a so-called configuration header, which tells the ROM code, this is how you set up the SD RAM, now load the kernel and boot it. That would get rid of the nine seconds or four to five seconds now. But sadly, we need a full featured system. So we need to look into auto optimizations. And we don't start a graphical interface there. So the cold start boot time till all the web services are up are beneath 10 seconds. And that's the same picture I showed you earlier. Further steps uh, to optimize it. Different kernel compression. This was with Zlib compression. You might choose LZO because it's a bit lighter weight. Uh, we did some investigation with that and at this point, the kernel increases as much as LC LCO uh, gains you on a slow CPU. On a faster CPU, you just lose Zlib. It, it doesn't make any difference anymore. Uncompressed kernels, they get twice as big and we're limited by loading from the slow SD card. So that's not as well, but that's what I tried last week after, my, after I did this presentation. And it helps to uh, experiment with that because if you're on a really so slow CPU, uh, the decompressor will take a very long time. For example, the OpenMoco GTA01, really slow CPU, it will take a long time. Uncompressed might actually help there. U-boot, we turned on the data cache. Everything got a lot faster, 
but suddenly networking in USB started failing because all U-boot drivers and literally all U-boot drivers are completely unsafe to use with Dcash and iCache. So the workaround we're going to use now on the BeagleBot project is to turn on the Dcash and as soon as you want to do something with networking or USB, issue the Dcash off command and hope that it works. It's ugly, but that's the current situation. Uh, we need to ship the boards uh, in a few weeks. And if you're in a graphic interface, GDM is really slow. GDM3 is a bit faster, but breaks a lot of existing infrastructure. So something like SlimDM, SimpleDM, or just no display manager. Uh, last week, the Enlightenment guys came up to me and said, we have our own, it's called Elsa. It's really fast, it had lots of eye candy, so you can try it as well, I haven't tried it yet but that will cut out a lot of time. And Gnome 2.x was used. That's not supported anymore. Lots of people are moving to XFCE or Enlightenment or LXDE. That starts up a lot faster as well. Most of the Gnome 2 startup is spent in Gconf, basically the Gnome registry. And it's nice that it's all XML based, but I don't want to spend 10 seconds crunching XML documents just to load the right background, which it is doing. GNOME 3 fixes that. It's not XML anymore. Everything is deconf and optimized, but that needs a GPU, which I'm not really a fan of. And all the Windows borders are 100 pixels, which doesn't fit on that screen. So you can make it work, but something like uh, XFC or EFL is a better idea. A few links, the Anxion distribution. And now let's see. When I said live demo, it's a bit of a lame demo. It's a serial console demo, so you won't see the graphical uh, desktop booting up. But it will show you uh, what it currently looks like. I re-enabled the uh, boot relay again. So let's see. This is U-boot, counting down, loading kernel, uncompressing the kernel. And there we are. And systemd has Lots of nice built-ins. Let's increase. Can you read that? Yeah. So it told us that the kernel started a bit. It probably did an internal fetch check because I yanked the power cord this morning. But the user space starts fast. And it has the built-in blame command. This is all using Python and Deba, so the analyze commands are a bit slow. So it tells us how much time all the services took. I naively started summing those up, but as you can see, 500 milliseconds plus 500 milliseconds is already more than a second. So these all run in parallel, but you can use this to identify a lot of uh, issues. When I did this talk last week, the system D developers were there and they said, well, just remove those con that console cat daemon that's not needed anymore. Um, syslog, they were writing a syslog imp implementation natively for system D, so our syslog can go. Uh, the far run is only there for compatibility, lose that. TMP, you could lose that as well. They said, well, you can optimize it even further. And then I said, well, this board is dual 1 gigahertz. Next week, when things are okay, I'm going to get the new Panda board, the ES, which will run at 1.5 gigahertz dual. So since it's CPU bound, we can uh, make it even less. And they said, yeah, you can optimize it both ways. And oh, it has the systemd analyze plot where you uh, can it to an SVG file, and it really is an SVG file, XML, and oh, to the right, that, that's exactly this, what I've showed you. So the current systemd will show you the host name, the kernel, and give you a summary. So that's a nice built-in tool. Let's see, is internet working? It is. Uh, but for real analysis, if you want to see whether it really is IO limited or CPU limited, boot chart is a better idea, which also generates an SVG. This is on the BeagleBone board. I ran the boot chart under systemd. 
that outputs a lot of more options. And this is IO utilization, so there's a big peak in loading from disk, but it isn't maxing it out. And if you look at the CPU, it is maxing out the CPU. So strangely enough, booting is CPU limited on these systems. As soon as you add other things like RAID or LVM or other services, it will really quickly become I.O. limited. So switching to faster disks, SSDs, uh, or in my case, SD cards really helps. But in these cases, it is CPU limited. So the faster your CPU, the faster you can boot. Which brings us to another interesting point. With the power management on these devices, just ramp up the CPU to full speed, boot really quickly, and then ramp down. That will actually save a lot of power. Uh, due to all the other subsystems turned on, like the LCDs and whatnot. So in this case, it's just going at full blast helps you save power. And this has a similar view of it, but it, this is more from the kernel point of view. And you can see all lots of things run in parallel. And the biggest thing is the thing called Node, which is our fancy JavaScript-based JavaScript web server, uh, which we need to support. And we're not really getting the 10 second boot yet because you see still a lot of going on, but we're getting there. So that was basically uh, the end of my slides. Do you have any more questions, remarks? BusyBox MDEV does not have that issue because it's uh, a lot more naive implementation. And currently, if you're using MDEV and not using the script functionality, you can just disable that because everything is moving to dev tempfs in the kernel. UDEV is really shrinking to only do the policy, like making compatibility sim links and setting permissions. So if you don't care about that, just don't use MDEV, don't use UDEV, and just use dev temp straight from the kernel. Class? You were, talk you were talking about the new board. Yes. The Beagle Bone? Yes, please. Since I do have internet, beagleboard.org slash bone. It's our new board. There should be a picture somewhere. Picture, picture. Uh, there we go. It's really small. Let's see if I have it in my bag. And since BeagleBoard.org is US-based, they said we need to make it fit in an Altoid tin, which is, is a peppermint tin. And that joke only works in the US. But it's a nice visual that you have the complete board in an Altoid tin. And you can take it out. So this is the new Beagle board. Um, we targeted at the Arduino type of people, so we have a lot of expansion where you can put in your own uh, board and do some soldering stuff. It has native Ethernet, not USB, but real Ethernet, USB host, USB client. Serial console is also over the USB port, so you don't need these things anymore. And it also has a built-in JTAG debugger. So if you want to debug bootloaders and things, you just only need a single cable for power, serial, and debug. The new bigger board people announced this week. And this is the end of my shameless plug. Any more questions? Yes? Uh, how do you explain the gap at the beginning of the boot chart? Uh, the, the boot chart, that is, th this one? Uh, no, the other one. The, oh, the, 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 where am I? The real boot chart. Yeah, that one. Uh, w which gap? Uh, the, that gap, sorry. Between yeah, the CPU. It does something, then it does something, and then something again. This is basically um, mod probing and doing things like that, and that is a big, uh, bottleneck because you need to have a few things started up before system D will start up things. Uh, I mentioned the socket activation, so it opens all the sockets and starts the daemons, but opening the sockets and parsing the config files takes a bit of time. 
it seems like a bit of much time, it's about half a second, but it's basically doing internal housekeeping and then starting everything in parallel. So that, that is the explanation for the gap. You can see it's doing I.O., then it's parsing, and then I.O. has stopped and it will uh, start all the demons. We need to optimize that out, but that's where the gap is from. Class again? I would, I would guess that in an embedded situation you would say, well, my config files don't change. Why not compile it all into system D? Right. Um, we have a few config files, but we wanted to have a generic solution because people are starting to run things like Ubuntu on it. So we wanted to make it as generic and extensible as possible. But you're right, if you really are getting serious about boot time, uh, systemd supports presets, you can compile a lot. And if you wish, you can remove a lot of things. Uh, don't use the UDEF timings, and then you can shrink it even further. But at that point, you can just eliminate systemd and write your own custom daemon or shell script to launch everything because uh, we're not launching much. It's basically you just dbus and the X server and the infrastructure around it. So in this case, that's easy enough to do completely on your own. But since people might install all kinds of crazy stuff like the JavaScript web server and whatnot, we left it as generic as possible. But indeed, you're right. In embedded systems, you can do your custom thing. That depends on your use case. Yes? How did you measure first stage boot? Um, uh, let me repeat that question. Uh, how did you measure first stage boot? Uh, r right now, I'm measuring it with a program called Grab Serial. Uh, you, you attach Grab Serial to a serial port, press reset, and the first uh, ROM loader identifies itself, and then you can get the timing information. That's what I discovered a few days ago. But before that, I would just hook up the serial console, put a stopwatch on next to my screen, point a camera at that, start recording, and then do. <laughs> and that's how I measured it. It's a bit unscientific, and Grab Serial is working a lot better because it's more automated than you can do it uh, without the video and the stopwatch and then going frame by frame. But that's how I measured it. And the rest of the measuring tools, like I said, are in system D itself. Um, sadly, getting one out requires Python. Um, so someone, if you want to have some fun with Dbus and C, please write a C version of that. But this is just good enough for debugging, because you only need those tools after you've booted. And any more? No, I think that's it. More pressing questions, remarks? Thank you.